everyone, and thanks for joining us for France Awakens Week. My name is Mireille, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the virtual experience of Cité de l'Espace, taking you to the world of infinite and the extraordinary. Now, this virtual experience is part of the Tickets Awakening Week, a six-week celebration of the reopening of our over 100 museums and attractions in six countries around the world. These venues have worked day and night to reimagine their experience and introduce new hygiene measures to make it safe again for you to visit. Now these venues are rolling out the welcome mat with these online experience for those who aren't able or not willing to travel yet, but still want to experience and reawaken cultural institutions worldwide. Now we will start the experience at Cité de l'Espace very soon now, but as soon uh, or as people are still joining us, I'll kick us off by sharing some logistical info about what to expect and how to use the Zoom tool. Um, if you have any questions for the presenter, you can submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom in the center of your Zoom window. You have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to send your questions through and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Um, you can also vote for your favorite ones by giving a thumbs up so that I will make sure to ask the best questions first. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so your camera will not be on, but you can still use the chat to communicate with the fellow attendees and the speakers. So uh, for instance, share your, where you're coming from, uh, or reactions during the sessions, you can all leave them in the chat to message all panelists and attendees. Um, if you're facing any technical difficulties, please use the chat to message, um, to send us a message to all panelists, and we will try to solve your problem as soon as possible. Um, and if you have trouble uh, connecting with audio, for instance, um, the best solution is to leave the, 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 the webinar and then rejoin again. And often this is the, the easiest way to, uh, to fix the problem. Finally, this presentation will be recorded and we will be sending the recording to all registrants in the coming weeks. Now, without further ado, I'm happy to hand over to our host for this virtual to, uh, experience. That's Nicholas, who's going to transport us to the world of Cité de l'Espace and give an insight in the life of an astronaut and let us also discover the wonders of the universe. So Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome here at uh, La Cité de l'Espace. We are in Toulouse, in France. It's the capital of the air and industry, uh, air and space industry, sorry, uh, in Europe. And so here we have a park that presents to you all the space discovery and the space technology. We have here 2,500 meters of ex exhibition, a big planetarium in IMAX, and big object, big science and space equipment, like this one I have behind me. It's uh, the biggest one in uh, La Cité l'Espace. It's the Ariane 5 rockets. And so if uh, you want, uh, I can propose you a little tour to go to space. So what do we need to go to space? First, as I show you, you need a rocket. This is Ariane 5. There is different kind of rockets. Ariane 5 is 53 meters tall. It's like a, a big building, uh, like a, the 16 to 17 floors. And it's 750 tons, like 90 trucks, it's very big. But it's not the biggest one. There is bigger, uh, there is bigger rockets, like uh, Saturn V. It was a rocket constructed in the 1970s. Uh, and it was 110 meters tall. So you can imagine it's twice the size of this rocket behind me. But we will talk about it later. Um, first, how does a rocket work? How can we go from the Earth to space? You have here uh, a main example of uh, an RN5. It's full. It's three uh, quarters full of uh, fuel and propellant. So two uh, ingredients to make the fire to go up. How does it work? I can show you. It's a, a, uh, a simple physical uh, principle, the law of action reaction. For example, I have this balloon. If I inflate it, I have the hair inside that won't go out. And when I let it go out, you have the action. 
and the reaction. It's when the balloon goes in the opposite direction. I don't want to lose this balloon. So that's the main principle with this uh, engine. When the engine will uh, work, there will be all the problem that ignites fire, and all this pressure on the floor will make the the rocket goes up. That's simply this uh, this thing. This rocket just carries satellites, European satellites, because it's a European um, it's a European uh, rocket. It can carry all the satellites if uh, the countries ask to use it. But it's a European rocket. You have different kinds of rocket, like Russians or Americans. And so you can imagine, you hear the sound of my of the flow of the air outside of the balloon. You can imagine the sound and the temperature under the rocket while it's burning. I don't want to leave that, so come with me and we go to see the next step. You can see here a lot of vegetation. We try to reproduce Guyana, where this rocket uh, starts uh, its lift off. Because it's the best place for us, for France and uh, Europe in, on Earth to go out of space, where the Earth has the, more, the most speed to help us to go into space. Now, we are in space. We are at least 100 kilometers up uh, in the air, and so we need something to leave in space, to travel in space. That's why we use spaceship, spaceship, sorry. We have here a part of a spaceship. It's the Soyuz. So this is the, what you can see is the part when the asteroid goes. There is three parts of the Soyuz. The first part is the orbit module, when you can go when you are in space. The second part is the service module when you can have uh, the oxygen, the fuel, and all the computer on board. And this part is where the astronaut goes when, the, uh, when there is the liftoff and the landing. So I can go inside, like you did before, and I can show you the position. Wow, it's very tiny. There is no, not, a lot, not a lot of space. I hope you can see me. I'm with my colleagues here. I don't know his nationality, maybe he's Russian, maybe there is an American, it's, it's international flights. So we are from all nationalities. I'm here uh, stuck with my space suit. It's like a ski suit. You don't move a lot and you, it's very hot inside. Everything is stuck and there is less pace possible and the less weight possible because you want to in a few minutes too. Uh, up there, so if you go outside, up there, there is the parachute to stop, uh, my, uh, to stop my descent, to slow it down. And down under my bottom, there is a heat shield. This heat shield will protect me from the heat that will, come, that it, that will be uh, made with the, 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 the pressure of the air on the spacecraft. It could, it could come up until, uh, to 1,800 degrees. So it's very hot here. So you have this tiny room. When you go up, you go for six to 48 hours in this tiny space and another space for the orbit uh, module. And uh, then you are with your, your friends and you just have to let the time go. And just this little teddy bear was here to show that there is, there were a teddy bears in a, a Soyuz spacecraft to see when the teddy bears is floating, that's when you are in space. Okay, let's go out. I will try to do it. Of course, I don't have the space suit. <sighs> I don't know if you still want to be an astronaut after this experience. So this is the Soyuz. Not yet. This is the Soyuz. Um, the, um, this, this, sorry, this is Soyuz. The, it's uh, the only way, it was the only way there is to go to space because uh, there were the space shuttle before, but we stopped the production in, the Americans stopped the production in 1911. So the Soyuz 
uh, the Russian Soyuz was on the way to go safely to space before. It was $70 million for one ticket, for one origin ticket. So they knew that, that they were uh, the only ones to do it. Uh, that's why the NASA uh, developed a crew, commercial crew program with Boeing and SpaceX to uh, private company to uh, make their own spaceships. And this summer, uh, in May and June, the, we saw the Crew Dragon, the spaceships of uh, SpaceX uh, that did the return path to the ISS space station up there and go back. So maybe we can choose later for the company we want to go to use to go to space but it will be still, I think, very expensive. So now we are in our spaceship, but we have to go somewhere, some, somewhere to live for months because this is not interesting to live for months. So you have here a station, a space station. This is the old one, the Mir space station, a Russian one. And I can show you a model of the biggest one, the ISS. The ISS, much bigger, the International Space Station. So you have all nationalities coming here, Russians, Americans, European, everybody. When you go, when you, yeah, the, what you see is the screen that shows you the place of the space station up there at 400 kilometers in the sky. And you can see where is it? Now it's passing up, it's passing uh, on uh, Indonesia. And you can see it online. So what I can propose to you is uh, to check when does the ISS uh, goes up uh, and pass uh, through your country. And uh, by night, you can see a tiny white dot passing through space. And that's probably the ISS. So just check it in the uh, next days. If you want, I can show you what's to be inside a space station because we want to know what is it. And that's why we are going to go up to see this space station. We have Mir, which means union in Russian, or world. We have the two traditions. Still, it's very big. It's the ancient, ancient version of uh, a space station. It's not yet in space. We don't have the the, the entire structure, it was 30 meters long, and now the space station who is actually uh, orbiting the, the Earth is 100 meters long, so it's like an uh, American football field. Let's go up, I follow you. And while uh, we are going up inside the space station, I want to talk to you about something that is in common idea. We think that astronauts live in a zero, real zero gravity environment, and that's not really the fact. In fact, uh, the space station is going down slowly. So, because the air, there is still a tiny amount of air in space and the air has make pressure on the, the ISS. So it, it's going down. And as how it, has it slowing down and, and going down, the astronaut does the same. So they are falling on earth together. And that's the experience of the zero gravity they can have. It's like when you are in an elevator and the elevator is falling down continuously and you are in the elevator, everything is floating. It's the same experience, but there is still gravity because you're going down, you're falling on something. Well, we arrive here in near the uh, mayor station. You can see everything is written in Russian, Cyrillic, and we can see what we experience in this Kind of zero gravity experience, uh, zero gravity daily life. First, here. Okay, everything looks very whole. Yeah, it's like Russian way of doing uh, Russian way of doing it. In the old time. So you have here the people sleeping in space. Of course, we need to sleep to rest sometime. You see the sleeping bags. Because when you sleep in space, you're floating. But if you float and you sleep, you don't know where you go. So you have to attach yourself in a sleeping bag. And then you experience the zero gravity way of uh, dreaming. It's a, a door or a, with the photography, a room, sorry, with the photography and uh, the computers by that time. 
Okay. You have to eat too. Here you have the table of the space, uh, sh the space station, or an old table. Everything is written in Russian. Now it's written in American. But still, you can see what it is to eat in the um, what it is to eat in the in the space. First, you want to eat dry food because dry food takes less space, and uh, you can preserve it for a long time. You can use uh, if you have. Um, if you have food that stick together, uh, spoons. But if you have food like uh, cookies or the kind of th uh, thing that make pieces, you don't want to eat them because they are going everywhere. And so you don't want to have pieces of food everywhere. You don't want to clean the space station all the time. That's, that's sure. Um, to finish with the food, you have two to three months, uh, two to three months you have uh, cargo comes to give you the supply. Sometimes you have fresh food. That's the good uh, part of the of the your your trip there. Well, if you eat, you have a diet. There is very there is uh, doctors who keep your, your diet very and follow, follow them very specifically because you are in very different environment. So we have to follow how you will keep healthy for the long trips. So if you have a diet, you have to make sport too. And here is an old bicycle, uh, apartment bicycle, that uh, astronauts use. You have the pedals here and the, the seat uh, a, bit, uh, a bit far away. And you can see a guitar, I, I haven't seen them. Yeah, because there is pleasure too on, on the ISS. So yeah, you make a lot of sports. Why do you have to make a lot of sports more than on Earth? Because uh, we are without gravity. So all the effort we make today to walk uh, against the gravity, you don't do them in uh, space. You just have to push and you go from one way, from one point to another point with uh, while floating. So you don't use your muscle that much. And that's why when astronauts goes, go back to Earth, they used to have a muscular mass uh, that reduced from 20 to 30 percent. And so you have to do sport to make your muscle act, uh, active and uh, use, use it. So two hours of sport at least a day when you are astronauts. You have bicycle, you can run to a, a running carpet, that kind of thing. Uh, it's in your schedule. What can I show you here? Oh, there is a lot of photographies and the toilets. So you can see here the toilets, a very specific system. Well, it looks a bit like uh, all toilets, but this one has a, a vacuum aspiration system because still, like the pieces of food, you don't want to have pieces of everything going out in the space station. It will be floating and you don't know where to keep it. I hate, I make sport, and even if I'm in space, I sweat, you know? So let's have a shower. Okay, you don't want to go out in space like me. You, are, you want to, take a, uh, a, a space suit, but today we're gonna do it without. While we are going to the shower, I can show you here some place where to stock the food. And here you see a plant because we will talk about it later, but uh, the astronauts are scientists that are here to, to do science experiment that we can't, can't do on Earth. Let's continue. Some antennas to communicate, communicate with the Earth. Some docking systems to have other modules or cargo or spaceships that can bring, that can uh, add to the space station. And then, because I still want to have a shower here, the personal hygiene place. We have the shower here, this big uh, box. It was for mere astronauts, cosmonauts, because still we are talking about Russians now. Um, the astronauts, sorry, the cosmonaut goes inside the cube and there is water pushed on the astronauts on the top and the water is sucked uh, uh, by, uh, with the tube below the astronaut. And so as, it, uh, as, it's, uh, as the box was uh, 
closed. You, have, you don't have water going out because still you don't want water on the electrical mechanism you have outside. The same system to, to brush your teeth or to wash your head. But nowadays, it's not useful to use all this mechanism. It was dangerous because sometimes water still go, went out. So nowadays, um, astronauts use a little pocket with water and put a little uh, a thin layer of water on their skin and use Oshibori. I will show you what's an Oshibori. It's a little towel like this. It's a Japanese towel, firstly. I just put little water on it. I have to put a lot of water and you can see that the towel absorbs the water and grows at, as it absorbs the water. Okay. I think we're in a good way. You see that no water goes out. So still, I don't have bubbles out. I can deploy my towel and then I can rub my body, I can rub my face with this towel. And that's my little toilet, my, my little hygiene uh, that I can do during my space, the, my, my space trip. This towel is put uh, in front of an aspiration system because as I told you, you don't want to have waste in the International Space Station. All the waste are put uh, in the cargo that goes down and burn. But um, as you don't want to make waste, you want to recycle everything to be autonomous. So every sweat, every urine, every piece of water you can have is aspirated by an aspiration system. And then uh, you can use, you reuse, reuse it. So basically the coffee uh, you drink is made of the water you made yesterday and the, and the same water you will make for tomorrow. It's a bit gross, but that's it. And that works for us not for a long time. So I propose to you to go out and still take your space suit with you. Follow me, yes, the sun is with us today. As we're going out of the space station, I can talk to you about, so you don't see it here, but it, this is the outside area, the place where you can put your spacesuit and go outside. We call it extravehicular activities, EVA. Uh, that's the, basically the photos of astronauts you have with a big spacesuit and they go by the door you saw and they do experiment outside uh, in the vacuum space very difficult moment for us not, but very important for us to understand how to live in space. So now we make our trip to space. Let's make a trip in time. Let's travel in time. We have here different equipment and uh, equipment that told, tell you about the history from the beginning, the, the history of space expression from the beginning until the end until the end, I mean, until today. I can show you here the lunar module. It's one of the biggest spaceship of, uh, the, ever built uh, by the humans. You can see it's seven meter tall and 10 meter wide. To the right, at the right of this lunar module, you can see the Soyuz. We talked about it before. Uh, the red part was the part when I went, the distant, uh, uh, the distant module. On the top of it, there is the orbit module when the astronaut can go uh, when they are in, uh, in space. And down there is the um, service module when there is the fuel and all of it. So you can see it's approximately the same size, but imagine that the lunar module, ha it's only the half part of the spaceship. So we can go down. It's half part of the spaceship, so you can imagine, I told you about the Saturn V uh, rocket before. You can imagine the size of the rocket that you need to use to bring this up, bring 
two pieces of it up uh, to the to space. That's why we need a very big, uh, a very big rocket. Nowadays, uh, the Americans are trying to build another mission to go to the moon. It's uh, the Artemis project, and there will be another big rocket. Of course, it's uh, America. It's the space space launch system, uh, which uh, is in construction, and maybe you will see in the next few years. But talk about let's talk about what they did 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, in 1969. Let's make a tour of this lunar module. So it's the landing module, this. It's the module that has to land on the moon, that had to land on the moon and go back uh, in space to, uh, to meet the other part, the module, the common module, to go back to, uh, to, to Earth. The lunar module has two parts, the descent, the descent stage with fuel, with oxygen, all the kind of stuff you need every, every time in a space, uh, spaceship, and the ascend stage, the stage where the astronauts are and where they will, that we, that, that will use to go up and to go back to Earth because they want to. Follow me to see here the stairs you go up in the ascent uh, this is the door in the ascent stage okay so if this is the door where the astronaut i think you know the name neil armstrong and buzz aldrin the astronaut went out of the lunar module in this uh, stage you have all the commands they are not all automate automated because uh, of course uh, we are in the 60s, 70s and uh, we are very far from her, so you, don't, you can't automate everything. So it uh, was more manual uh, landing, thanks to Neil Armstrong. Here you have the plate of Nixon to say, yeah, we are here to come in peace and uh, discover, for humanity to discover the moon. So here, at least in the we are trying to reproduce the story uh, that happened, we make you leave it. So basically what happens, you imagine I have a spaceship, of course we are on the moon. You imagine that I go how I go down, I am Neil Armstrong, the first human who will uh, put uh, the foot on the moon. And unfortunately I have the spaceship, but uh, the landing was not very good. I land not that, uh, not too, 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 too strongly, so the foot are not enough on the on the floor. So I have to jump like this, but I don't know if I can go up with my big spaceship. Unfortunately, there is less gravity, so I can't do it. Sorry for the for the wind. And now I will say my very known sentence. Now it's a small step for me, but a, a giant leap for humanity. For humans, sorry, it's mostly for human, but gently for humanity. And then we developed all the things that happened on the moon. You can see panels all around. That's where, from the lunar module, happens all the, the stuff here. You have a photo of the footprint made by Buzz Aldrin to check what was the soil of the lunar module. There. I can show you where the flag, the flag, the American flag was standing. And we are eight meters to the lunar module. So we represent really the historic phases of uh, the, the historic uh, story of, uh, the, 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 of the first uh, step on the of the man on the moon. We show you what experiment they did and we show you at the end, uh, the back, uh, the back, uh, the, the back side of the story. Now that we did the past, let's go to today. And first, I would like you to imagine the astronauts on the moon. You are on the desert, magnific magnificent desolation, as Buzz Aldrin said, and you see in the sky the Earth. 
when you're on Earth, when you see the moon in the sky, it's a pale white circle, and you can hide it with a P, you know, a green P. When, when you do that, in the sky, you can hide the moon, even if it's 3,000 kilometers wide, 3,000 kilometers in diameter, but it's 300,000 kilometers apart from Earth. So that's why it looks very tiny in the sky. Imagine yourself now as an astronaut on the moon. You have to see the Earth very far from you, your home, the pale blue dots, and can do the experience at home. This is the Earth. Do you see it? This is the Earth. Then this is the size of the Earth seen from the moon. So it's like the size of my nail, of the nail of my thumb when I point my arm. And if you go back, if you go away, the Earth becomes to be a little point. And that's why I want to show you now the experience we do outside of the lunar uh, Earth system. And we go to other distances and to other, um, to other distances and to other time because we go today in 2020 and we will go to Mars, the red planet. Uh, a planet which is a million kilometers away from us. And we are very pleased today to have a model of a mission, the Mars 2020 mission with this robot, the rover Perseverance, a maquette of the real size, uh, of the real size, uh, uh, a real size, sorry, model of uh, the, the rover. You can see here different part of it. So perseverance, why does the NASA talk about perseverance? Because the NASA has other countries, but uh, especially NASA, persevere in um, looking for life on Mars. We already found water, we found my mineral that can host life, and then we are trying to find the traces of life, of ancient life uh, on Mars. We are looking for the evidence, real evidence. Yet with the mission, we haven't seen yet these evidences. So this, uh, this rover um, left off with uh, his rocket, Atlas V, uh, this summer uh, in, in July, and he has to land, maybe, he has to land in February 2021, 2021. Nowadays, it's on its path from Earth to, to Mars. This, uh, Rover is the same as Curiosity is a colleague on Mars who is already working and still working on Mars. I want to show you some of the parts of this rover. For example, you have to work autonom autonomously on Mars. So you need batteries, energy. That's the motor. You have on the back, this part is a radioactive engine that make the energy even then you, when you are, don't have um, when you don't have the solar energy. You have, of course, the wheels that you already see with Curiosity, the ancient rover. And then you have some specification that only Perseverance, Perseverance, Perseverance has. You have the head. So Curiosity already has a head, but this head is very specific. It's Supercam. It's an instrument, science instrument made by a uh, uh, French team uh, here in Toulouse uh, from the National Center of Space Science. And this cam is a laser that can hit the ground, make the melt the, the rocks and analyze the type of the rocks you have in front of you. Very specific engine. You have a microphone engine, so we have like eyes and here uh, on Mars. Some cameras, of course, to see uh, what does the, the robot see? And antennas, you can see one of antennas, it's the uh, round uh, object near uh, on the back of, of the robot. Then I want to show you the helicopter down here. It's Ingenuity. Ingenuity uh, is the 
will be maybe the first helicopter who, to make a flight on, on, on another planet than Mars. And it's, it seems very easy, but uh, in fact, it's a bit difficult because you have to turn the rotator much better than on Earth uh, because the air pressure on Mars is much, um, there is less air on Mars. So you have to make it, uh, make much more energy to go up. Maybe Ingenuity will show us some uh, beautiful view of Mars. We'll see it later. And then, I wanted uh, to show you two experiments. MOXIE. MOXIE, you can't see it. It's a box inside Perseverance. It's a box inside Perseverance that will uh, transform the dioxide carbon, the carbon dioxide, dioxide of Mars, of the Earth's Mars, in oxygen. So maybe astronauts later can breathe the oxygen made by this machine. Nowadays, we can't bring astronauts there because we need oxygen to live, and that's what we don't have on Mars enough. And finally, this harm. Curiosity also has a harm. So you can see five joints to move the arms as a human arm. And you can see the hand here. And I want to show you how does the arm work. So it's with this little experiment. We have Curiosity, who has the harm too, and Perseverance. They want, they want to extract some uh, a sample from uh, from the from the soil. So deploy the arm, extend it, and put the hand on the floor. Curiosity used this kind of drill. So it's a drill that will uh, crush the soil, make it powder, and uh, because of the tube, the, it can help to make the powder goes up inside the hand of the robot and make it uh, analyze after it. So I can show you. Now, how does it work? You can see now the powder made by the drill. And as I continue, the powder goes up through the drill at what I can get after the extraction is this powder. This powder is analyzed on Mars by the science laboratory, the, the other name of Curiosity on the laboratory on the rover. And now we have another way to extract sample with this kind of drill, an empty drill. And that's what Perseverance has on his end because he doesn't want to destroy the rock sample. He wants to make, to preserve it, to analyze it on Earth. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Okay, I think that's okay. And this. Okay, so it's another way to do it. I don't. Destroy the sample. And as you can see after this, you have the sample, you have a cylinder inside. And this is the cylinder I want to analyze. Inside, maybe there is sign of ancient life. So I keep all the drill. The robot will put the drill inside uh, a collector inside his body. And then when he puts it in the tubes and the, the tube will be full on the, on the floor and recollected by other missions. And maybe in 2031, scientists could analyze and tell us if there were really ancient life on Mars. So this is one of the mission we have to show you uh, here in um, in uh, in uh, Las Tiles Pass, but we are uh, we are also showing you some kind of experiment about uh, we make we make about uh, the uh, uh, about the moon. For example, there is the Chen He uh, mission nowadays in uh, December. We will follow the the actuality, and uh, we have experiments about. Uh, how to know about the universe outside. I think it's okay for me for the tour. And I see behind me or in front of you, behind you, Christoph, who is the chef of the education, science and culture department. And he will answer, I hope, uh, of, uh, your, uh, to your question. 
we just need five minutes to exchange uh, the hip flex. Yes, so thank you, Nicholas, for this wonderful um, educating and fun tour. I think when I read all the comments from people in the chat that uh, everybody really appreciates uh, the way you gave them a virtual tour in Cité de l'Espace. Um, I personally really like the, the, the demonstrations that you gave and it gives us a good idea of how things sort of works and, and how, how an astronaut can survive in, um, in space. Um, yes. so, uh, so really, thank you very much for, uh, for this thank tour. And as, Berg, uh, as uh, Nicholas already mentioned, um, we are being joined by Christophe Chaffardon. Uh, he's the director of education of uh, uh, the Cité de l'Espace and um, joining us to answer lots of questions, hopefully, uh, because uh, I've seen uh, many uh, of you being active in the, in the Q&A box. So let's quickly start and, uh, and try to uh, answer as many questions uh, as possible. So let All right. me have a look. Uh, the first question is from Cadence or Cadence, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but what's the criteria or requirement to, to be sent into space, basically to become oh. an astronaut? Yes, the question is how to become an astronaut, of course, is what we want to know, especially when we are younger. And, uh, and a lot of visitors ask a question here in Toulouse, in the city of the space. Well, first of all, first of all, I would like to say that it's, uh, what is important is, is for us to be very motivated to, to, be, uh, to become an astronaut and to, uh, to face all the danger that, that, that exists to, to, to go to space because it's, it's something dangerous. But, but it's not enough to be motivated. You need also to be, well, I have to say, good at school, good at math, good at science, good at uh, technology, but also good is in, in language. You have to speak, for instance, Russian, if you want to go to the ISS. Or maybe you have to, to speak also Chinese as well. So you have to have different skills. You have to be a sport man or woman. You, you like, for instance, any kind of sports. You like planes, maybe you, you already pilot some planes. And, uh, and above all, maybe, the most important uh, skill is being able to learn every day something new. That's very special. When we are pupils in school, we used to, to learn things every day because we go to school with the teachers. Uh, an astronaut is 25, 28, 30 years old. Anyway, he will every day learn something new to go to space, to be able, for instance, to repair whatever in the ISS, or to be able to uh, experiment any kind of uh, science in the ISS. So uh, yeah, maybe motivated, good at school, good at sport, and, and able to learn every day. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Olivier is asking, what's the future things we want to do in space, let's say in the next 10, 20 years? Oh. There's so many things to explore. There are so many things to explore in space. I'm just in front of the Perseverance rover, Nico, in uh, charge to uh, maybe, first of all, is try to discover if there is any uh, kind of life uh, still uh, in, in the solar system or maybe, uh, maybe uh, in, in the universe. We, we don't know if life is existing somewhere else so that's a big enigma and maybe maybe this kind of robot will give us some uh, some element of course what we need is also to go there and to study more the planet so going with robot is really important because that bring us a lot of information but sending astronaut to mars will be one day a wonderful opportunity also to know more about the planet and to know more about our own origin. So uh, maybe in a 10, say 10 years, I don't know if we will be able to do that in 10 years. Actually, 10 years, maybe, and 
I think will be enough to send again a man or a woman on the moon. We saw uh, the land module, lunar module, just before with Nicola, but uh, in 10 days, I, I say, I'm quite sure that will be a, a woman who will make another step on the moon. Well, let's see. Maybe she will appear in your, uh, in your museum one day then. Yeah. Uh, the next question from Anne-Marie. What do you consider the best discoveries from space travel? Okay, from space travel, oh, that's a very, there are so many uh, uh, interesting results. Uh, to me, that's a really personal point of view. I'm still very impressed by uh, what the USA did uh, in '69 and, uh, and 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 the years after with the Apollo mission. We uh, here in Toulouse made all the celebration. It was last year for the 50 years of the first uh, step on the moon, and till now, to me is something still incredible uh, to send all these people and to be able to bring them back, uh, take them back to the earth safe. And this is really something that, uh, well, actually we're not really able to do again. When we do that, maybe in 10 years or less, but for me it's the most impressive uh, result of the space flights. And, uh, and of course, what is also to me, uh, let's say, uh, important is what uh, will happen now with uh, the new exploration of the moon and also uh, of Mars. All right, um, another question. Um, can you share information about the flight into space in terms of what smells are there and what sounds can people hear? Um, yeah, I mean, you say the everyday life in the space station. Well, there is, you know, what is important is to, to, to know is this is really not natural for a human being from a, a woman or a man to live in the space station and space because of weightlessness. You know, the way that all, everybody, everything is floating due to, uh, to weightlessness. So there's a lot of things that are changing. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the size of all the astronauts is growing when you're in space because as the Earth is not attracting you, the, all the bones you know you have on the back are not you know going that way. In the weightlessness, they are separating a little bit from one to another, and that means that your size is increasing our well. So it could be uh, three, four, five centimeters more. So it's really weird. But when you come back on the Earth, <laughs> you come back also to your uh, normal size. Uh, things also very weird is that you cannot smell things and you, very well and you cannot have the the same taste of what you are uh, eating you know for instance uh, we, we do a, a very simple experiment here in 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 Cité de Las in Toulouse and maybe you can do that uh, after this interview you take just a, a little piece of chocolate you see a very little piece of chocolate you put your no your, your finger on the nose like that and then you begin to eat Okay, you don't really feel the flavor of the chocolate. And when you liberate the fingers, suddenly all the flavor is coming up and you feel the chocolate. Let's imagine that for the astronaut, is always like that. They cannot really have the flavor of what they eat because of this weightlessness and because that the air is not going the same way that on, on, on earth and, and the flavor of the mouth and the tongue cannot go up in the, on, on the nose to, to, to get this flavor. That's why a lot of meals are very spicy for the astronaut because they need spice to feel the flavor. Something weird and it's not the, the lonely way, but just some examples. Very interesting indeed. Um... Another question, what's the coolest thing about taking off? Oh, <laughs> I don't really uh, know or think it's uh, the coolest thing to take off. <laughs> Me, I never try to do that because the problem is that you, uh, you know, 
feeling like if you want like that. Let's imagine where I'm taking off from Citadel's Pass and go to space right now on the rocket. I will be pressed, you know, very strongly, very strongly, all the body. And this is a lot of months and years of training for the astronaut to get used to that, not to be sick in a few seconds because they need to resist to this pressure, to this uh, uncomfortable situation. <laughs> and it's not very useful. They can test that, they can train that with centrifugation equipment, you know. You maybe already saw this kind of things, the centrifugation equipment uh, make you uh, used to do the same, uh, used to, uh, to experiment the same thing that uh, when you are taking off. But I think it's quite uncomfortable. So I don't know if it's really cool. What astronauts told us, because there are a lot of astronauts who are coming here in, in, in Cité de l'Espace and talking with us, uh, uh, talking with all the visitors, they say that, of course, they are very concentrated, but the magic moment is when you pass through all the atmosphere and then the vessel is injected to go to a trajectory and you are suddenly in weightlessness, you know, from in, in, in one second. That's why in the vessel you, 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 uh, you can see some uh, objects that are suddenly floating like that. And uh, when the astronaut observe this object floating, they know that they are in weightlessness. So they can liberate from the belt and begin to float. So maybe it's the coolest thing. <laughs> Sounds magical. Um, another question. Do you have examples of moon rocks at Cité de l'Espace? Yes. Yes, we have. We have a moon rock in Cité de l'Espace. You know, uh, when the, the Apollo mission astronaut went on the moon, they collected, so there were, there were 12, 12 astronauts who went uh, on, on the moon. They collected on all the Apollo mission 382 kilos of uh, moon rock. We got a little piece of a mm -hmm. real moon rock that NASA gave us to present to our visitor and we thank NASA to that. And uh, so they can observe this and it's very rare. Let's imagine uh, what is representing uh, for us, you know, to get to the moon, to collect, and we know exactly one in 60, uh, 72, uh, when an, uh, the, the American astronaut Pick, take this moon to uh, bring it back to, to the Earth. And now it's in Toulouse, south of France, here, and everybody can observe and imagine what is representing something. Uh, I mean, there is no value for that. So we get one, yes, and we <laughs> invite you to come to visit it. <laughs> All right. Um, how did Toulouse become the heart of the aerospace industry? Oh, that's so how a, did it begin? Yeah, very interesting question. Well, let's say that uh, it was, let's say, uh, 50, 50 years ago, something like that, when uh, France, because France was really engaged very, very early in the, in the, in the space, uh, in, in the sort of research. And uh, it was a time of, um, you know, re remember perhaps there is a very famous president of France called Charles de Gaulle, you know, Charles de Gaulle. And he decided in the 60s to uh, put all the brand new uh, budding space industries or, or research lab, lab agency in Toulouse. Because in Toulouse, there was already a tradition of plane. You know about plane. You know, there are many, many people here who are working for Airbus Industries, for instance. And so as there were already people engaged in this kind of skills, in this kind of uh, knowledge, uh, it was a good opportunity to put all the space activities or put a lot of space activities here in Toulouse. So it was in, in, in the 60s with a national space agency, the agency called CNES. You, you, you saw maybe perhaps the logo here, CNES, who is really the French NASA. And uh, so many people are still here working in CNES and also in a private firm who built satellites and labs who are... Uh, working and trying to know more about our solar system, for instance. The guys who made some uh, work about the, the super behind me are, are three kilometers from here. 
Okay, so uh, well, many people from the 60s and now it's developing more and more. Capi uh, right. Toulouse, in a way, is the right of European capital for space. Yes. Is the space he? Uh, the, sorry, is the spaceship heated, or the spacesuits? Sorry, I didn't understand what you mean. If uh, if the spaceship is heated, or that there is like maybe some heat things in the space suit. Oh, you mean what? 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 We need the space suit. The, That's the, it? The, 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 I think they're they're talking about the, the the space outfit, whether that's heated or not. Oh, and it's also heated. If it, the it's space heat, heated, as in warm. Okay, so and also uh, the spaceship. Oh, I don't know if uh, if it's uh, um, so for, for the spaceship, the vessel, the ISS, for instance, heated. Well, normal temperature in it in, is twenty four, twenty five degrees Celsius because there are a lot of equipment while heating the interior of the uh, of, of the space uh, station. So that's okay for the guys who are going outside from the from the ISS to make some extra vehicular activity they have to make to put this uh, suit as not suit to uh, be allowed to breathe normally and also to protect themselves from the, the huge difference there is on their body with the heat if you are an astronaut you go out okay in the space you will have the sun just in front i'm an astronaut in the space i got the the sun in front of me. The sun will hit this part very, very hard. It could be 150 degrees. But my back, who is not exposed to the sun, will be very cold, minus 100 degrees Celsius. So the, the suit is able to uh, make some equilibrium balance, thermical balance for the body to be allowed and to be okay to make some work uh, outside uh, the station, repair some sort of panel or doing some uh, experiments uh, outside. Yeah. All right. So I'm uh, looking at the time and unfortunately we're almost running out. So let's do okay. uh, one more question or basically yes. two, two questions in one. Uh, how many people can be in the ISS at once? And how does, it yes. get, how does the ISS go into space? All right, so uh, ISS is like a, a, a gigantic vessel, a gigantic mechano. It, it uh, has been built uh, during uh, years and years, it began in 1998, and during years they sent with rockets little pieces who uh, like, like the mechano, the sounded uh, from one to another to become at least a very important uh, spacecraft is, is the size with the solar system of a football, uh, you know, playground about. Okay, so th this is huge. In this uh, station, you could have uh, six astronauts all together well, when they are uh, common mission all together. Actually, there are three and, uh, and it could be six uh, or sometimes seven as well. And uh, and this this is yes the the the, the, nor, the, the normal amount of astronaut in, in the ISS. We will see uh, what happened in the next future. We uh, talk more and more about um, a station who will be in orbit, not in the Earth orbit, but on the Moon orbit. You know, what we call the the, the, the space gateway, lunar gateway, and we will have also permanent. Uh, maybe permanent astronaut in it, and we will be very, very curious to see what happened there. All right, let's do one final one because it's Friday yes. and it's almost weekend. So, and I think <laughs> there are so many questions, and uh, and it's so interesting. It's a, a, a very interesting topic. So, um, how long um, will the astronaut stay in space? Oh, so actually. Actually, for instance, I have to say that of French national astronaut, well, say, it's a European astronaut from ESA, European Space Agency. Well, this is French, it's called Thomas Pesquet. He already uh, flew, uh, flight, uh, have a mission in the, in the ISIS and he will go again in ISIS next year in 2021. And he will stay six months in the ISIS. Actually, it's a normal uh, stay. For, for, for a mission in the, in the International Space Station. 
the the longest way just for one mission it was a very long time ago uh with a russian who stay uh, uh 437 days in the mir station you have a run in a mir station with nicola just before as well so uh, the problem is that if you stay a long time very long time in weightlessness so let's say more than one year, one year and a half, there are some changes in your body. For instance, as you, as you don't have any um, you know, gravity effect, effect on your body, that means that your bones are more and more weak, you know, and they could break easily when you come back. And it is not reversible in a way. You cannot correct that when you come back on the earth. So that's why if we want to stay a longer time on the ISS, or if you want to go to, uh, for instance, to uh, a longer travel to Mars, for, in, for, for, for example, you will need to have um, something like a centrifugation, for instance, or we have to find a solution to let the astronaut having some moment of gravity effect on their body to, uh, to prevent that, face this problem. So. Uh, so six months is uh, is already uh, enough to have a real experience of uh, our weightlessness and, uh, and space mission. Wonderful. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us for this Tickets Awakening Week's virtual experience. Oh. As mentioned before, all the recordings of our Awakening Week's virtual experience, uh, including this one, will be made available in the coming weeks. And if you're in France uh, and you also want to experience France Awakening um, in person, please visit tickets.com slash Awakening Week for information on all uh, our Awakening Weeks around the world, including this one. And last but not least, I would of course like to thank Nicholas and Christophe and the whole Cité de la Spas team for organizing this wonderful, like really wonderful um, uh, virtual experience. Uh, and um, I wish you a very nice weekend. Again, thanks every, uh, all the participants for joining and we are looking forward to finding more ways to culture with you again soon. Have a great right. weekend so, and see yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're very excited to do that and uh, you will be more than welcome in Toulouse. Bye-bye. Great, bye-bye.